Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 2023 sequel, Aquaman, The Lost Kingdom. Now, I enjoy the first film. I think the first film is actually pretty solid as superhero films go. So I was uh, looking forward to this one. And I'm not going to sit here and say that I think it was really disappointing, but it was a little disappointing. Because in all honesty, it's definitely a couple steps down from the first. And at best, it's just a time waster that's somewhat enjoyable. It's directed yet again by James Wan. And I think Wan's direction picks up where he left off with the first movie. I think the direction in this is still rather dynamic, rather interesting. It still has some cool different sorts of camera work that are employed throughout the movie. He still does a good job shooting the action when it is there or the moments of spectacle or sequences that are really trying to focus primarily upon visual eye candy still does a good job for the most part, maintaining a consistent visual tone, good uses of pans, zooms, wide shots, up close shots, uh, frames the shots well. Overall, it's a nice-looking film, just like the first movie, and it features some pretty uh, relatively efficient and fairly consistently good direction by James Wan. So he's definitely the most, I would probably say, the most consistent performer when it comes to this movie. Now, there's only so much that James Wan can do when it comes to his uh, approach and his overall uh, take on this film. Like a director can do a lot, but a director can't necessarily make up for a less than stellar screenplay. And and I think that this is a screenplay that at best is firmly mediocre. For one, I don't really think the story is as, as compelling or as interesting. There's some, so, there's some decent concepts here like necros and his army and the usage of of ice instead of uh, a lot of water so you have a different form of water but this time around it's ice so that definitely is something that had some aspects that that worked i also liked the fact that there's a, a, an entire sequence where it returns to the desert and the other kingdom that was in the desert from the first movie. And it leads to a rather a thrilling and exciting action sequence. But right from the beginning, things are just off when it comes to the script. It starts out with this weird tone where Aquaman is now married to Mera and they have a kid and he's staying at his dad's place with Mara, trying to raise his child. And he's there's narration from Aquaman as if it's some kind of family comedy. And you get the cliched stuff with the baby who's peeing on him. And it's just like, what? What are we doing here? Like, the tone just seems totally different from the tone in the first movie. And it's just rather jarring when it comes to how things start. You get a little bit of some, you know, fun fisticuffs with Aquaman in one scene. But when you juxtapose it with that family stuff, with the baby peeing and, and all that, and Mara using her powers to make the baby uh, aim its pee towards Aquaman, because Aquaman dodges the pee the first time, it's just like, ew. Like, it just gives you, like, this sense that, oh, this is not going to be as good. This isn't going to be as fun. I think the fact that it only has one writer in David Leslie Johnson McGoldrick, who was one of the co-writers of the first film, is definitely something that bogs this film down. The script isn't completely and totally a misfire. It doesn't completely drown itself in uh, detrimental qualities. There are some good things about this script. I think the concept and the idea of Necros and his army is cool. Like the idea that this Necros was 
the brother of the original king of Atlantis, and then he went rogue, and then he uh, became corrupted by this energy source card or a calcum, and it wound up it it ultimately turned him into a, a monster, like a, a a beast of sorts, and then he decided to use his newfound mutant abilities and the orcalcum and then he turned his entire kingdom into monsters and that's how he created his army and and um that's the lost kingdom and so the original king of atlantis had this big battle with necros stopped him and his army and then put a curse on them and essentially froze them in antarctica and so I didn't mind that concept. I don't think it was well executed when it comes to Necros himself in the finale, but I like the idea of the lost kingdom and I I like the idea of Necros and his army and it does lead to some fun bits of action. And I do like the Orichalcum. I like the fact that there, there is this dangerous energy source that's like mutating plant life and bugs and making them into uh, uh, complete and and just utter monstrosities, or even bigger monstrosities than they already are when it comes to some of the insects. So it leads to some Kong Skull Island kind of uh action and and fun when it comes to uh the sequences on the volcanic island that's being uh mutated by the orichalcum and. I like that they're trying to get Black Manta more involved, but I still don't think that the script really does a great job with Black Manta. I don't know if it's Black Manta himself, and maybe he's just kind of one-dimensional, or maybe it's just the way that these writers uh, write this character. Because Black Manta just feels like a completely boring one-note villain. He felt that way in the first film, and it's even more so here, even though he has more screen time. And it just exposes the fact that Black Manta, with how weakly he's being written, is not enough to be the main antagonist. And yeah, he has his own army of uh, soldiers and scientists that are straight out of a 60s uh, James Bond movie. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he has really that much that leads to him being particularly compelling uh let alone interesting like there's some stuff involving him and he gets possessed by the trident of necros and so now he's got necros who is kind of controlling him and puppeting him around but that doesn't actually help black manta that makes his character even worse because now in order for him to be able to be a formidable foe to Aquaman after he got his butt kicked by Aquaman in the last movie, he has to be a puppet for another villain. So if you're a Black Manta fan, it's nice to see Black Manta again, but it still comes with a, a lot of questions and a lot of uh, issues that I think could have easily been avoided, but they still ran into them anyway. But I do appreciate the fact that this script winds up combining Orm and Aquaman and having them be in the movie, but in a way that is a, is different. It's not just the two of them having this battle with one another. It's not the two of them winding up butting heads and then Orm becoming a villain again and he's the real threat and Black Manta is just a side piece again and kills Necros and takes Necros's power like they don't do that and so I do appreciate that when it comes to this comes to the script I, I appreciate the fact that the writer was like nah I'm not gonna do that instead I'm gonna focus on the redeeming qualities of Orm and I'm going to make it more of a buddy cop kind of movie where Orm and Aquaman have to reluctantly team up to stop Black Manta and to stop uh, Necros. And 
those are definitely the strongest parts of this film other than some of the action and some of the fun ideas like the mutants on the volcanic island because there's a lot about this that is just not really that great when it comes to the writing and I heard I heard something that there was a lot of stuff that was cut out. I know that Mara had a bigger role and, and that was cut down because of Amber Heard and her issues at the time, which is understandable. And I also read something that King Neris was also supposed to have more screen time and they cut that down because of Mara's role being cut down. But even with that, it still feels like King Neris has more to do in this, which was something that I also did appreciate when it comes to the screenplay. But there's only so much you can do with a script that just has these fun moments, but isn't consistently engaging and entertaining throughout. Because there's a lot of dull moments in this, a lot of stuff where there's not an action scene happening. They're trying to establish uh, some drama and, and not really doing that great of a job with it. For instance, Aquaman's father, you have his character, he's involved a little bit here, Thomas, and he's still, you know, having a, a relationship with Atlanta, and they're still happy, but, you know, Atlanta still has to do her stuff in Atlantis, so she can't always stay with Arthur's uh, father, Thomas. And so it leads to Thomas being vulnerable. And there's a moment where Thomas gets wounded by Black Manta. And Black Manta steals uh, uh, Aquaman's baby because he needs the blood of a royal to be able to resurrect Necros. And, okay, you put the baby in danger, all right. But you do the typical thing where, oh, he just harms Thomas and doesn't kill him. So it's like, it seems like it's trying to go in a route that makes Black Manta into more of a formidable threat. But they don't even follow through fully on things. And then by the time you get to the climax, yeah, he initially kind of gets an upper hand on Aquaman, but then eventually still gets his ass handed to him, which is what happened in the last movie. And then when there's a moment of redemption that could possibly occur to make that character a little more interesting, the scriptwriter doesn't even want to go there. He's just like, oh no, Aquaman offers to save him while Necros's kingdom is crumbling and uh, Black Manta is just like, no never and then jumps off into a chasm and you're like really that would have made his character a lot more interesting but instead you just made him look really dumb and look very cliched and lame but yeah and there's just a lot of stuff with this script that's kind of lame the humor at times is kind of funny at other times it's not I mean, there's a repeated gag where Orm develops a taste for cockroaches. And I'm like, that's not funny. That's just gross. And there's some other stuff like that humor-wise. So I think humor-wise is definitely not as good as the first film. Script-wise, it's not as good because it doesn't really have as compelling of an antagonist there's some fun ideas, some fun concepts here and there, some sequences that are somewhat enjoyable, like the scene at the, you know, the pirate a kingdom at Atlantis with Kingfish and the scene where Aquaman breaks out his brother Orm at the Desert Kingdom and it definitely has its moments when it comes to the action. There's some fun action bits in this, whether it's fisticuffs or laser guns or stuff like that. It was cool to see Aquaman use his powers to, you know, get all these sea creatures to, uh, like the whales, to band together to disable the the submarine that has the the sound wave machine that is the the sound wave gun that's causing all these problems. 
for Aquaman and and other people in Atlantis. But like I said, the villain is weak, whether it's Necros or Black Manta. You have this stuff with Dr. Shin, who had a cameo role in the first movie. is and He has an extended role in the script for this film, and it's not good. It's another instance of him just being kind of useless comic relief half the time. And they try to redeem his character, and it's somewhat successful by the end of the movie. But you're still like, dude, you still followed this psychopath and did all this awful shit like you're not you're not a good guy either let's be honest and then that's that's kind of a vibe that this script just kind of gives off anyway like yeah orm it is fun to see him partner up with aquaman like a much better version of thor the, the dark world when aquaman when you know thor teams up with loki but it still rubs you the wrong way a little bit because of what Orm did to become Ocean Master in the previous film. And that's just pretty much forgotten about. And now it's like, oh, he's a good guy now. And Aquaman lets him go. It's like, it's like Bad Boys. You know, Bad Boys for Life with uh, uh, Will Smith's uh, son in that movie. It's like that character, Armando. It's that kind of vibe where you're like, yeah, but you still did all this shit. You still did all these heinous things. You're not a good guy, but the script is still painting him as such, which is definitely a little forced. And Necros just gets done dirty by the end. Like Necros, they do a decent job making him kind of interesting. In a lot of ways, the, the, the story and the origin and like the way that he presents himself is just poor man Sauron from Lord of the Rings, but still like, it, at least it's a different kind of villain and it's not just black Manta again or Orm again. So I'll give it that. But once Necros gets unfrozen, he just gets a trident thrown at him. He catches it and then he gets another trident thrown at him and that one actually stabs him and then he explodes it's like all this build up for this new villain and he basically does jack shit of anything. Like he's just useless and, and, and defeated in like 30 seconds. I guess they were trying to focus more on the whole scene where Orm has the trident and Necros is trying to manipulate him and give his power to Orm so he can become Ocean Master again. And it's a lot of stuff where Orm has to fight uh, 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 the the mental strain and, and the manipulation from Necros and do the right thing. And you're just like, of course he's going to do the right thing. There's no way he's going to let Necros control him. So it is one of those deals where there isn't as much tension when it comes to, f to the finale, because you pretty much know exactly what's going to happen. You know exactly how it's going to play out. And then I will give the script to this. They do have a moment at the end where Aquaman does, does convince the council of Atlantis to come forward and make themselves known to the surface and work together with uh, the surface level scientists to, uh, reverse the damage that was done by the work calcum and done by climate change and i'm like okay it's a nice message to kind of end the film with but it's still one of those movies though that is just average from a screenwriting perspective and just average in general but the screenplay is a big part of why it just barely expands upon things that were brought up in the previous film. It barely provides more character development and depth for Aquaman and Orm and these other characters. And like I said, the villains are weak. They are not really set up that well as being interesting, let alone that formidable when it comes to being foes for your heroes. Now, the cast, they do their best. I mean, Jason Momoa, 
I think he's honestly more of the same when it comes to what he did in the first movie. He has more speeches here and is not good. But when it comes to the moments when he's just, you know, being uh, the dude bro kind of thing and and just drinking beer or, or just playing off of Patrick Wilson, it's fun. It's a it's a decent enough performance. Speaking of Patrick Wilson, I, I liked him a lot in the first movie, and I liked him a lot here too. Uh, I think it was it was nice to see him have some moments where he could, you know, be comedic uh, and be a little bit less of a tight ass. So that was kind of fun to see, and it was fun to see him get involved in more action scenes and and have this role where he tries to become more of a hero. I just don't think that the script did the best job when it comes to providing him with enough nuance to work with, but I still feel that it was a good performance. Amber Heard, I don't think she's as good in this as she was in the first film. I, I think the fact that she doesn't really have a lot to do is very, very limiting. And I know that, yeah, this was around the time of the trial and she gets a lot of crap and well-deserved for the way that she treated Johnny Depp. But her performance in this, it's not the worst thing ever, but it's definitely not as, not as charismatic as what she did in the first film. I honestly feel that she did a, a, a pretty good job in the first film as Mara. Here, it, something is just not right. And I'm wondering if it, a lot of it is her her head just not being uh, there because she was focused on so many other things in her life when she was doing uh, this film and shooting this film. Uh, Yahya Abdul-Mateen too, he's back as Black Manta, David Kane. And I, I, I felt like he wasn't an intimidating or a strong enough presence consistently in the first film. And I was worried about him having more screen time as a result and he gets more screen time here and yeah, he's not a strong enough actor to, to make this character into anything that is really that memorable or iconic. He's trying, he's trying to bring some intimidation or some level of badassery to black Manta. And there are a couple moments, but for the most part, it's just more of the same of what he brought to the first film. But this time around, he's having to carry everything when it comes to uh, the antagonist. And it just he just isn't really a strong enough actor to do that. Uh, Randall Park, he was okay as the nerdy biologist guy who's suckered into working for Black Manta and then has a change of heart. Dolph Lundgren, it was, it was great to see him again. And it was nice to see him actually have more screen time and more to do in comparison to the first film. So I felt he did a pretty good job. Timur Morrison, I mean, he had less screen time, less scenes to work with, but did okay. Martin Short, I didn't even recognize him. I didn't even know he was the one that voiced Kingfish until I checked the, checked, uh, the cast. And then I'm like, wow, Martin Short. He's the one that voiced Kingfish. Cool. He did a good job voicing that character, the Jabba the Hutt esque uh, leader of the Sunken Citadel. Nicole Kidman, once again, just kind of barely in there uh, in the film. Uh, Will Willem Dafoe doesn't come back uh, because of the fact uh, that. He wound up uh, dying off screen, which sucks, which is lame. I, I, I think that that's definitely something that was a mistake. Like, why'd you have to kill him off off screen? Why can't you just do something where he's off doing something else or he retired or something? Why do you have to kill him off? I, I felt that was pretty, pretty lame from the from uh, the writer's um, 
perspective. I guess it's not Necros. The guy's name is Kordax. It's Necros is the kingdom. But I thought I thought that the character was Necros. I I, I got it wrong. But I mean, because Necros just sounds better. Necros sounds a, a lot better than Kordax. Kordax sounds. It doesn't sound like the name of a, of, a, of a villain or a king of a, an undead army. It really does not. Kordak sounds like some kind of nerdy side character. Some some guy who, you know, Matthew Kordak or some shit. Like the, the name of some guy who worked at Star Labs, who, who wound up getting experimented on and turned into some really low-rent villain. And that's what that sounds like to me. But I apologize... I'm calling him Necros the entire time. It's not. It's Kordax. It is what it is. John Reese davies also voices the Brian King. He voiced the Brian King in the previous film. And it was fun to, 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 uh, to hear John Reese davies again. And you could tell he had fun playing that character. So, cast. Not the greatest thing. Not the greatest cast. Not the greatest group of performances, but it's not particularly terrible either. The cinematography by Don Burgess is just kind of meh. Feel the same way about the editing by Kirk Morey. The score, sadly, is more is also pretty mediocre, pretty just serviceable by Rupert uh, Gregson Williams. Rupert, he did the score for the first film. And this just sounds like recycled beats from the first movie. It doesn't even seem like he even tried to do anything new. Like, it's fine with recycling some key beats from the first score, but, like, to not even try? Because that's what it sounded like. He didn't even try that hard to create a score that sounded any different than what he already did previously. And I'll give the film this, like it's 124 minutes. That's with the end credits, but like it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's too watered uh, down or too uh, waterlogged, so to speak. It's not sinking under its own weight most of the time. And I think there can be some fun to be had with this sequel. Like if you like the first movie. I think you can have some fun with this one, but it's definitely not as good as the first film. It's not as well written. The direction is still as good. And I think when it comes to some of the main performers, the the, the performances are still pretty fine. And I think there's still a lot of moments of nice eye candy and some fun action scenes. And it was fun to see some practical stuff as well, just like it was in the first film. When it comes to like the Atlantean soldiers armor or, uh, you know, the other sort of stuff that they did practically in that movie here, you have like some of the creatures that are actually done practically like the desert creatures that are the ones that are holding Orm captive. A lot of that was practical. Some of it was CGI, but there's a lot of people in practical makeup. Same thing happens with, uh, Necros's, uh, uh, or Kordax's so soldiers. There was a lot of uh, stuff that was done practically with them, which made for some really exciting, fun action scenes because of the fact that you had these real, you know, people in real suits, and you had Jason Momoa and some of these other people like actually being involved in in fights. So it wasn't all done with a computer. So. That was definitely something that I did appreciate about the film. But, I mean, as a finale for the DC Cinematic Universe, it could be a lot worse, but it definitely isn't a strong finale. Like, it doesn't go out with a bang by any means. But I wouldn't say it necessarily goes out with a whimper or a wet fart either. It just, it just slowly just drifts off to see. Like that's kind of a good way to sum it up. It just that this film is like the, the the last gasp of the DC Cinematic Universe, and it's just like the DC Cinematic Universe is now 
nothing but like a little piece of 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 a raft floating around on the ocean and you just have Aquaman hanging on as he drifts off it uh further and further uh into the sea it, it's it is what it is and i do appreciate the fact that it really wasn't trying to be anything other than a sequel to Aquaman it wasn't trying to do anything more than that it wasn't trying to be some kind of a uh, callback or have some sort of connection to some of the other DC cinematic universe movies. Wasn't trying to connect to Shazam or black Adam or anything of that sort. It was just like, nah, we're just a sequel to Aquaman and that's all that we are. And so I think that's definitely something I think that's going to help this film in the long run, because I think that's going to help it like get a little bit more of an audience because of the fact that it can just work as a standalone film. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it's as bad as some of the critics made it out to be. Uh, I think a lot of the really harsh criticisms were because they wanted to use this film as a punching bag for it being the last uh, desperate uh, uh, hurrah or, or gasp of the DC Cinematic Universe. So because of that, I think it had a pretty massive target on its back. And I think a lot of critics were taking advantage of that. But I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as they were making it out to be. There are a lot of other films in the superhero genre or uh, in the DC Cinematic Universe that are worse than Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. I just think that this one is just, it's okay. That's really what it is. It's just okay. But anyway, thanks for watching my review of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And until next time, I'll see you later. See ya.